Welcome, everyone. Welcome, everyone. We will get started in just a moment. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's Lunch and Learn, Planting for Pollinators with the Wild Seed Project. We hear a lot about honeybees, but much less about the myriad of other pollinators like native bees, moths, butterflies, be beetles, flies, birds that also support our feeds, food systems and our ecological webs. So what native plants and management strategies can help create habitat for those hardworking pollinators? Can wildflowers do it all? Or are there more pieces to the puzzle? Here to answer these questions is Anna Fielkoff. Anna is Ecological Programs Manager at the Wild Seed Project, a Maine-based organization dedicated to building awareness of the vital importance of native plants and to providing people with the tools to restore biodiversity in their own communities. Anna shares her deep knowledge of native plant ecology, horticulture, conservation, and ecological landscape design to help demonstrate ecology in action. We are so glad to have you with us today, Anna. My name is Kathleen Neal. I am the Director of Policy and Partnerships here at Maine Conservation Voters and Maine Conservation Alliance. Our organizations represent more than 13,000 members and supporters dedicated to protecting Maine's environment and our democracy. MCA does that through education, collaboration, and advocacy, and MCV by influencing public policy, holding politicians accountable, and winning elections. A few technical notes for today. We will hear from Anna first and then tackle your questions in the Q&A session at the end. You do not need to wait though. You can send your questions to me through the chat whenever they occur to you. I will keep track of them and ask them in the, the Q&A session following the presentation. <clears throat> we ask that you not message Anna directly as we want her to be able to focus on the presentation, not the chat box. Please message Will Sedlak if you have any technical difficulties and he will help you out. This event is being recorded and the video will be posted on our website later this afternoon, where you can also find recordings of all of our previous Lunch and Learns. Thank you all for joining us and Anna, I will turn it over to you to kick things off. Thank you very much. Um, I'll share my screen now and get going. Okay. Um, well, thank you everyone for joining and thank you so much for uh, the Maine Conservation Voters and Maine Conservation Alliance for um, hosting this talk. I'm very excited to be part of it today. Um, I am, as uh, Catherine just mentioned, I'm Anna Fialkoff, the Ecological Programs Manager for Wild Seed Project. And thank you so much, Catherine, for sharing our mission statement. That helps a lot. Um, if you're a little less familiar with what we do at Wild Seed Project, I just wanna give you a few um, pieces of information about us. Uh, we are, as Catherine mentioned, um, dedicated to sharing the vital importance of native plants and all that they can do to restore resilience and biodiversity in our landscapes. And we do this in a number of ways. We actually um, educate the public through things like this, these walks, talks, and workshops that we do throughout Southern Maine and in webinars that can reach farther afield. Uh, we also put out an annual publication. Um, in the last couple of years, it's been a native plant guide of some sort. We're currently trying to cover all the different layers in the landscape. So we started with native trees for Northeast landscapes, um, this one here. Then we moved on to another pocket guide, um, native ground covers for Northeast landscapes to get to the ground level. 
And this year we're working on native shrubs for Northeast landscapes. So please stay tuned. We also sell seeds of native plants. And we think that that's a really great way to get more biodiversity into our landscapes in a really efficient way. Um, first of all, native seeds contain really important genetic material in them. Um, and each native seed is different from the next. So each has this ability, unique ability to potentially adapt to the climate change and landscapes um, of the future. And so I also think it's really important to plant native species when possible and native seeds because you get the chance to grow your own native plant and watch it to, into, go into maturity and plant it out into the landscape and see it in all different stages of, of its life. Plus, never less the fact that native seeds are actually a very economical way to get more native plants into your landscape rather than needing to buy a whole plant. But we also encourage you to support local native nurseries that are dedicated to um, best practices. And I'll go into that a little bit more in this talk. So when thinking about planting for pollinators, I want us to think beyond flowers. The flowers are extremely important. And think about all the different things that we do in our landscapes throughout the year and everything that we plant that could potentially encourage and create opportunities for pollinators or create harm. Before we really get started with the program, I just wanna make sure that we acknowledge the land. Um, I'm coming from Maine, from Southern Maine. I'm in Portland right now. And whether or not you're in Maine or farther afield, I think um, it's important that we take a little time to recognize this land. Wild Sea Project has carefully crafted, crafted a land acknowledgement, um, and I will read that now. We'd like to recognize that we are leading this program from the unceded Wabanaki territory we now call Maine. We recognize the inherent sovereignty of the tribes of the Wabanaki Confederacy, the people of the Don. The Abenaki, Maliseet, Mi'kmaq, Penobscot, and Passamaquoddy and honor their relationship to the plants, animals, and other beings that have been threatened and displaced through settler colonialism. The work that we do at Wild Seed Project is necessary precisely because of the ongoing impacts of colonization, including centuries of industrialization, urbanization, and commodification. Bringing native plants back to our landscapes is one significant action we can take to decolonize our practices, our priorities, and our perspectives. We also encourage you to learn more about the land that you live on and join us in supporting indigenous-led efforts to protect the land, water, and creatures among us. And so um, this is a great website, if you've never checked it out before, um, to explore uh, the, the tribal territories of your region. It removes the current political boundaries so that we can see historic and current tribal territories um, and learn a little bit more about yourself there. Um, you can see that Maine is in the lower left corner here, but the Wabanaki territories extend um, deep into Canada and Quebec, New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island and beyond. And you can see all the different tribes of the uh, Wabanaki Confederacy. So when thinking about native plants, I think um, it's easy to get caught up in the word native and um, we don't really need to. I think it's good to define what a native plant is and um, really when you think of the word uh, native plant or the phrase native plant, it's important to, at the, the very core, to understand that um, we're just talking about supporting our local food webs. Um, that's just the basis and the most essential piece of why native plants are important. Um, native plants were here uh, pre-European colonization, that's how we define them at Wild Seed Project, and whether that be in a specific region, a specific state, or a local even 10 mile radius, um, you can kind of define native plants based on very particular parameters um, in terms of location, and you can widen those out to even North America. But 
what it comes down to is that um, they were here for thousands of years and have developed these really deep interconnect interconnected relationships with the wildlife that depends on them. Um, and after European colonization, that's when a lot of more movement happened. Um, plants were brought from other continents and started to kind of populate North America. And I think that that really drastically has changed the landscape. So looking at that point in time is um, specifically because um, we our, our landscapes have changed a lot since European colonization. And when we look around in our landscapes currently, we actually Besides some of the trees, although there are some invasive trees, we are seeing mainly a higher percentage of non-native plants, whether they be innocu innocuous, you know, weeds from Europe um, or other invasive species that are causing environmental harm. There are very few native plants in um, a good portion of our landscapes, especially the more developed landscapes that have um, just been um, disruptive of the native plant food web and ecology. So I encourage everybody to kind of get a hold of one of Doug Tellamy's books. He is um, an entomologist at the University of Delaware, and we follow his work pretty closely at Wild Seed Project. If you are kind of initiated into the native plant world and why native plants are very important for our ecosystems. Um, you've probably read Bringing Nature Home, and that was one of the first books that really got me interested in native plants. And then his one of his more recent books, Nature's Best Hope, gives us some action steps that we can take to actually encourage more biodiversity in our landscapes. What he has done a lot of research on with uh, various graduate students and other researchers is the really interconnected relationships between native plants and insects, and particularly the moths and butterflies, because in their larval stage, their caterpillars are feeding on all different species of native trees and shrubs and herbaceous perennials and, and annuals. So those caterpillars are actually really essential uh, food for reproducing songbirds, especially in early spring, the baby birds are fed on a diet, mainly of protein rich caterpillars. And if you think about that, that's like a perfect little protein nugget um, to fit into the mouth of a baby bird. It's nice and soft and palatable. Um, so because the native plants feed all these caterpillars and other insects and wildlife, um, that is why we really think of them as the basis of our local food webs. So one of the first things that we can do to encourage moths and butterflies, which are sometimes pollinators and sometimes not, um, is to plant different species of native trees. Native trees have the most you know, biomass. They have huge amounts of leafy uh, branches and bark and trunks and root systems. And they not only soak up stormwater and cool and regulate the ground temperature um, and often store huge amounts of carbon to offset climate change, they also, the native species are particularly important for all these different insects and other wildlife. So the top trees, which Doug Tellamy would call kind of the keystone trees, are oaks, willows, cherries, birches, and poplars. Those are the top five. And maples also, the native species, um, make it into the keystone list, but are just not quite in the top five. But still, all of these support hundreds and hundreds of species of moths and butterflies. And they do that because their caterpillars feed on the leaves of all of these species. And oaks are what you would say are the very top. Um, in this list because actually Doug Tallamy's most recent book is called The Nature of Oaks and he goes into how oaks all over North America and even other parts of the world are some of our best wildlife habitat plants um, for this very reason and because of all the other things that they offer to wildlife including their acorns and the just the structure of their the tree branches and everything provides a lot of places for wildlife to find forage and cover um, and so oaks are really that top, but I want to kind of give you an example of one of the life cycles of one of our 
native giant silk moth, the Cecropia moth, um, because it's one of its main host plants is the black cherry, along with other species of cherries and other a few other species of trees and shrubs. Um, but it really does rely on black cherries quite a bit. Um, so in the spring, it actually in late spring, it will hatch um, from its cocoon and that's called a closing. It'll close from its cocoon. And whether it's a male or a female, if it's a female, it will kind of stay in place and the male with these really wide bushy antennas are able to um, find the female through pheromones scent. So they can fly up to a couple miles away and find a female and they fly at night. So you may not have seen these beautiful large uh, moths because they fly at night and they're only in their adult stage for just a couple of days out of their whole life cycle. And they're huge and beautiful. They're just as beautiful as many butterfly species. They can sometimes get to be the size of a small bird. Um, they, the female, once they've reproduced, will lay her eggs on the the leaves of her host plant on the underside of the leaves, and then they'll hatch and the caterpillars will go through a number of different instar stages where they they eat and then they shed their skin and get a little bit bigger. It's called molting. And then they do that again several times until they're big enough to, by the middle of the summer, uh, middle to late summer, to pupate. And they'll form their cocoon on hanging from the branch of their host plant. Um, and then they spend the winter that way. And then the cycle starts over again in the next May or June, depending on where you live. So, you know, the caterpillars are also really cool looking. They have kind of these spiky red and orange and blue balls on the end of their bodies. And they're really fun to, to watch eat. They, they can get quite big, um, but we don't often see the caterpillars very often of many of these different moths and butterflies because they're up in the canopy a lot of the time in the trees. Um, so, you know, you can understand why this life cycle is really important to acknowledge that the trees are really the basis of that. Um, and these actually don't happen to be pollinating insects. They do have mouth parts, but they don't actually eat as adults. So they're not going from flower to flower, though other moths actually do pollinate and lots of butterflies, as we know, are pollinators too. Um, but they make important bird food. So that's one of the main you know, roles in the ecosystem that they have. And they are often susceptible to being parasitized by different species of wasps. Um, they're very vulnerable because they've been losing habitat, which is mainly their host plants and then the forest floor, the leaf litter that uh, many of the different species of silk moths actually spend the winter in. So while the Cecropia moth um, hangs from the branches of its host plant to spend the winter, it's kind of protected. It's up off the ground, keeping it uh, protected from predators. But Species like the luna moth, which many of you might be familiar with, will actually drop down from the tree as a caterpillar underneath the, the leaf litter, and it will actually form its cocoon in the leaf litter and hang out there for the whole winter. So that leaves that species a lot more vulnerable if the leaf litter should be disturbed. When we think about um, planting native species, as I mentioned earlier, we do want to really make sure that we're buying and growing pesticide free plants. That's the my top goal when I look to buy a plant at the nursery. And this can be actually really tricky to do because the nurseries are not very transparent about their practices all the time. There are some and if they're specifically advertising that they don't grow their plants with pesticides, I would trust that. Um, but you know, you I would um, make sure that we are researching the nurseries that we buy plants from, um, not just relying on plant lists by different organizations by, by Wild Seed Pro like Wild Seed Project and others. We do need to sometimes do our own research too. And what you can do is sometimes call up these nurseries on say a rainy day when they're not out in the field or in the greenhouse or in the winter day and ask them if they use pesticides on their plants. Um, and the more kind of consumer demand that we make for pesticide free plants, the, the more, you know, we're going to potentially tip the scales in the right direction. Um, there are more and more nurseries that are understanding the really ill effects of pesticides. 
on our pollinators and even our European honeybees, um, the pesticides that a lot of nursery use are what's called these a class of pesticides called neonicotinoids or systemic pesticides. And they can last in the plant, the whole vascular system in the plant and their leaves and other tissues for several years after they've been in, um, applied. So that means that if you buy a plant from Home Depot, even if it's a native blue lobelia, for instance, it might be feeding pollinators, but also there could be other harmful consequences that that plant is bringing into the landscape. And it could be toxic for pollinators as well. So really do your research. And I think a really good resource that you can go to is um, on our website called Navigating the Nurseries. It's an article that actually spells out a lot of uh, the things that you have to kind of watch out for with when you're buying plants. And we do also have a plant list. It's called Where to Buy Native Plants, or a, a nursery list on our website. So search that as well. And that's divided up by, um, by state. So you can kind of get a sense of um, what nurseries are in what states. And just keep in mind, it's not comprehensive at this point, but we're, we're getting there. And if you know of a really great nursery, feel free to email us so that we can add it to our list. So another um, action that I think Doug telling me would recommend would be for us all to shrink our lawns at least in half. Um, and if you have the ability to get rid of your lawn altogether, that would be great. But he says not to take away your lawn altogether because uh, necessarily, because first of all, lawns, you know, they do serve some function. So it's just that what's unfortunately happened is that our lawns have become the default in the landscape. So a good way that you can think of it is lawns creating more of like an aerial carpet. Um, oh, sorry, uh, yeah, an aerial uh, rug in your landscape rather than kind of the wall-to-wall -wall carpet. So um, you can think about actually having the lawn be for specific spaces that you know you want to have outdoor rooms or places for gathering, recreation, because lawn does function as a great um, medium to kind of walk on. It can handle a lot of foot traffic. Um, or you can keep the lawn for pathways. And if you're worried about ticks, um, you can widen the pathways so that they're at least three to four feet and you're not kind of coming into contact with vegetation um, on a daily basis when you're walking outside of your door. You can also plant lower plants right next to your pathways so that you're not kind of having tall plants kind of leaning over the pathway. Um, but the average lawn is going to, you know, that's kept pristine and uh, as a monoculture of just the um, grasses and no broad leafed plants is going to have, you know, regular applications of fertilizers and pesticides and often be irrigated. Lawns are some of the most irrigated crops in the US. And it's funny because it's not a really a crop, it doesn't produce anything. So lawns are, are really essentially sterile places for wildlife. They're not going to foster too much wildlife habitat unless you let it flower a little bit more. Even non-native lawn weeds can be more beneficial than mowing your lawn so frequently. So taking steps like the lawn that does exist in your yard, maybe mowing it less frequently, letting it flower, and then narrowing in and hemming in the lawn over time is going to be just a great way to bring in more habitat for pollinators. So I really like how this um, lawn is kind of showing that, you know, it's, it makes a great gathering space. Maybe there's a grill spot, a um, place for a tent um, and a picnic table. Um, and then the outside edges of the, of the lawn are basically just a mowed edge and the vegetation is left to grow up. And you have trees and shrubs and taller perennial meadow plants and shorter meadow plants and a nice variety of different things growing there. So I like to say why mow when you can meadow because meadows are just so much more beautiful. You can have flowers uh, growing up in what was once lawn at different times of year. This is a nice late season meadow with um, New York ironweed and Joe pieweed blooming in August. And a little bit of that golden flower is the um, autumn sneeze weed in the back that doesn't actually make you sneeze, but I'm not sure why it's called that, but it's a beautiful flower closely related to a sunflower. 
And um, these can, at other times of year, provide spaces for bees to nest as well. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, you can also have areas of your um, smaller spaces that maybe are hardscaped with um, brick patios and things like that, and have a little bit more ornamental value in a smaller space by having a variety of different layers of trees and shrubs and um, small ground cover plants, even vines going up over arbors to provide even more wildlife habitat. This is a beautiful fall scene actually at, at a place in Portland, um, a small backyard. And you even here have small shrubs and other plants in containers where they might not fit in the garden beds that are so small, but you can kind of temporarily host um, some shrubs in some of these kinds of spaces. So this yard is really stacked, packed, and layered with lots and lots of vegetation. And that vertical structure, having all the different layers in the landscape, the tree, the canopy trees, if you have room for them, or small flowering trees and shrubs underneath, with um, vines growing up arbors and smaller shrubs and, and ground covers is going to create more biomass or more places, more surface area for pollinators to eat the leaves and to find flowers to gather nectar and pollen and fruits and seeds and things like that. Um, another thing that you can do is add, you know, plants that um, are particularly great for certain species of pollinators. So the hummingbird, for instance, if you want to attract hummingbirds specifically to your landscape, you can plant a lot of different tubular flowers that are high in nectar content. That's what the hummingbirds are adapted to be able to um, gather nectar from. So those are plants like trumpet honeysuckle or cardinal flower, scarlet bee balm. Reds and oranges are great colors to attract hummingbirds, but they also will pollinate the um, wild bergamot, which is another species of bee balm, and uh, azaleas and red columbine. So a wide range of plants. And what I would do is instead of having necessarily a hummingbird feeder, um, which is basically a sugar water, and you have to clean that out very regularly to not actually do more harm to hummingbirds, you can feed them with flowers and have flowers that are blooming at all different points during the growing season. And don't forget those shoulder um, growing seasons, the early spring and late fall, because during migration, they also need a lot to, to eat. Um, and then you'll potentially be fostering some more habitat for uh, hummingbirds. I also see hummingbirds nesting in large canopy trees. So having those canopy trees where they can nest way up high out of the sight of predators is really important. They nest in oaks and maples and all sorts of other species. I've seen them in yellow birch as well. And this trumpet honeysuckle is just one of my favorite uh, vines because it's a very tidy vine. It doesn't spread. Um, and it does, it's kind of, you can think of it as a shrub. It's a woody vine that you can kind of prune over time, but I like it to let it get nice and full and dense because actually this was a vine that was in, in my, in front of my office when I was a horticulturist at um, Native Plant Trust at their botanical garden called Garden in the Woods in Massachusetts. And we would si see uh, Phoebe's actually nesting in here and the hummingbirds going back and forth all the time and a wide range of other pollinators. So it's just one of my absolute favorite vines. If you want to encourage pollinators, and like I mentioned, those shoulder seasons, this early spring and late fall, you do want to make sure that there's forage um, for bees and even wasps. Not all wasps are the stinging type. They're not all paper wasps. Um, but there are many different species of bees and wasps that really require having some asters and goldenrods for the late season. And they're, these plants are very floriferous. They'll um, add a lot of beautiful color. I love the combination of asters and goldenrods, the, the purples and the deep pinks and the blues and the with the yellows. Um, those are perfect complementary colors that just 
come out in the in the late summer and fall and are there I think those complementary colors do attract pollinators even more because they look great next to each other they really stand out in the landscape and in addition to being important forage for um late season forage for pollinators asters Astr and goldenrods are also considered keystone plants. So they support hundreds of species of moths and butterflies, not just when they're in flower, but with their leaves. So the caterpillars of those species will feed on their leaves all throughout the growing season. So they're just powerhouse plants. And I think that every garden or planting deserves an aster and a goldenrod. And every garden or planting can hold an aster and a goldenrod because at least one species of each because they're um, plants that have a lot of diversity. Um, there's plants that, you know, asters and goldenrods that do well in dry sunny areas and shady moist spots in um, dry shade and full sun, average soils, a wide range of conditions. So for instance, the flax leaved aster does well in very sandy soils. It's native to actually the coastal sand plain habitat. And this one um, is nice and short and upright. And so it doesn't get more than maybe six to eight inches tall. It stays nice and low and is a really great garden plant for a sunny spot. Well, the zigzag goldenrod would be great for a shady garden. It doesn't get more than two, two and a half feet at the very most. And it forms a nice um, colony. So it is more of a ground cover plant. So it does spread out, but it has these beautiful oval shaped leaves and a zigzagging stem with flowers growing up it and home to lots of pollinators, even in a shady spot. Blue stem goldenrod is also great for the shade and it looks great with the blue wood aster. Um, those are both a little bit more versatile and can handle some shade, but also a little bit of sun and average soil to dry soil. So you've got something for every condition really. And I haven't even covered all the other varieties of asters and goldenrods. Supporting pollinators is, as I've mentioned, it's really about supporting their full life cycles. So even though we want to plant flowers um, to make sure that the um, pollinators are supported as adults, um, we still need to think about you know, their larval stages. So we can plant the turtle head plant that's actually a native species that grows in swamps and um, the edges of wetlands and uh, really likes sunny or shady um, wetland spots. And its uh, main pollinator is a bumblebee because the bumblebees are able to pry into those closed flowers, the tight-lipped flowers um, that you can see in this photo at the top middle. But turtlehead also supports um, the Baltimore checker spot butterfly, it's the one of the main host plants for it. And the checker spot will, if I want to go through another life cycle to kind of demonstrate um, what's important for the Baltimore checker spot butterfly, it lays its eggs on the turtle head plant and the eggs will hatch um, in spring. Um, a lot of different caterpillars will come out of those eggs and they'll kind of stay within their group and form this protective webbing around them. So that's what you see in the top right picture. When they go from branch to branch, they'll actually use that webbing to kind of launch themselves over like a bridge to the next branch and eat all the leaves from that. So I like to say this is a really good example of if you see some webbing or an insect munching leaves on your plant, that's not necessarily a pest. And in fact, it could be a really important beneficial pollinator or other insect. So they, they crawl down to the base of the plant in the fall. They're not ready to pupate quite yet because they need a second growing season to forage even more and store up enough energy to pupate. So when they crawl down to the leaf litter, they actually are getting ready to spend their whole winter in the leaf litter as these really, as these immature caterpillars that are very vulnerable. So if there's any disturbance to that leaf litter, then um, those caterpillars are not able to go into their adult stages. So, it, and finally, in the second growing season, they forage a little bit more on their host plants, and then 
um, are able to store up enough energy to pupate and form these absolutely gorgeous chrysalises. Um, and then the cycle starts over. But as adults, they're pollinating insects that require a wide range of summer blooming flowers so that they can find nectar and pollen. So you can see that to support the full life cycle of the Baltimore checker spot, it needs not only flowers for pollinating, it needs its host plant, and it needs the leaf ground layer to kind of stay intact. So I think this demonstrates very much why, um, you know, what we plant is just as important as how we manage those plantings. I encourage everyone to leave their leaves when possible. I know you can rake up those leaves from, you know, the lawn areas where it could smother the lawn or from sidewalks or driveways and things like that. But in your planting beds, this is a good opportunity to leave your leaves because they sustain birds through the winter. There's often lots of insects and seed heads laying on the ground um, that the birds will eat through the winter, the non-migrating birds. And they protect overwintering creatures, not just moths and butterflies in their cocoon or caterpillar stages, but also bumblebees and uh, frogs and salamanders and other creatures that are spending part of their lives in actually under the leaf litter, either in the top layer of the soil or in the leaf litter itself. They also, the leaves as they fall, they break down and build living soil. Um, they are an important um, mycorrhizal kind of food and substrate. So you'll see when you lift up leaves in a mature forest from the forest floor, you'll see these little gray or white threads weaving through the leaves in the top layer of soil. And that is actually the um, most of the the system of a fungus. The fruiting body, which emerges up at the top and releases its spores, and those oftentimes the, the pieces that we eat of the mushroom, is just a small piece of the mushroom, but the leaf litter and the healthy soil is what keeps those mushrooms able to kind of keep going. The, the leaves also insulate plant roots. So through the winter months, we are often seeing less and less um, snows that actually stick or keep up enough layers to really insulate the plant roots. Um, so we have to rely on leaves to do that too. Um, a good layer of, you know, two to inch, uh, two to six inches of leaves is going to help insulate those plant roots through the winter. So we, we can consider, reconsider our yard work and our garden cleanup. Um, underneath trees is a perfect spot to remove grass and replace it with a planting bed, either with a, a native ground cover that's easy and low maintenance or layers of shrubs and, and smaller trees. Um, wherever we have space, we can fit in more native plants. And that will accommodate more areas for the leaves to go uh, when they do fall from the tree. I think we can reevaluate how we value trees in our cities and suburbs and other landscapes because oftentimes people do think about trees as nuisances that drop leaves and fruits and things that we have to pick up after. But if we're valuing our trees because they provide all sorts of ecosystem services for us, then we're not going to think of what they drop as a nuisance. We're going to value the leaves that drop because those are a great way to keep the nutrient cycle closed um, instead of bringing in outside sources of you know, bark mulch or things like that. We can use leaves as mulch and leaves can be um, a really great way to um, sustain that living soil and all the creatures that need it for their full life cycles. So we shouldn't be kicking our leaves to the curb or blowing them to the edges of the landscape and to the woods. We really need them to stay where they are. So this is a great article on our website that you can read to learn more about how you can manage your leaves and when you're thinking about leaving your leaves. Also, leaf standing vegetation. That standing vegetation, the seed heads from different sunflowers and coneflowers and other species are going to provide food for birds that stay over the winter. Um, the tall stems and sticks are also just going to provide that much more cover for wildlife to be 
protect it from predators. Um, but standing vegetation is also a way to add pithy stems or hollow stems for those nesting and, um, and hibernating native bees. So a lot of our native bees are actually solitary bees. They're very unlike the European honeybee. Um, we have, I think, over 270 species of native bees in uh, Maine and even more in other parts of the Northeast. And that means that we need to provide lots of opportunities for them to complete their life cycles too and reproduce and keep going because with pesticides and lots of habitat, we are seeing drastic reductions in our native bees as well. And um, something like the common elderberry, it's kind of a semi-woody plant or a flowering raspberry. Those, both of those um, can provide these chambers to, um, for the native adult bees to either hibernate in over the winter or to lay their eggs in come spring and summer. Um, but there's also many other species like Joe pieweed and goldenrods, asters, ironweed, um, and many others, pretty much most strong stem tall plants are going to be providing um, those kind of nesting chambers for many species of native bees. So leaving those stems up is really important. If you do feel like you want to cut things back a little bit to keep it more tidy, um, I would suggest not cutting below 18 to 12 inches, and that will allow enough space for the sometimes up to 30 rows of eggs that bees will lay into those um, stems and keeping up up the whole season round not just cutting them back in the spring or cutting them back in the fall is important especially over the winter but all season because the, sometimes they need the stems that are nice and dried out to lay their eggs into so that means sometimes the second year stems um, so last year stems so you need to keep them all up as much as possible. And it doesn't have to look like an eyesore. You could, like with a purple comb flower, for instance, if you just cut it back to about 12 inches, 18 inches, then the foliage will cover that um, those standing dead sticks by the middle of the summer. So you're not even going to see those dead sticks by the middle of the summer. We can also provide some opportunities for nesting for different bees and wasps in the ground. So bees and wasps don't just nest in standing vegetation, they nest in grit in the ground or in um, upright, um, upright snags in the woods of dead you know, trees, um, sometimes in old woodpecker holes. So a lot of those places where there's a chamber for them to lay their eggs into or nest. And I really like, you know, if you do have an open patch of sandy soil, um, say you live in a coastal area and you have a lot of sand and gravel, um, you can leave those spaces open for ground nesting wasps like the great black wasp. It's also called the digger wasp. That is not a, the type of wasp that will be stinging necessarily. Maybe if you are stomping on its nest, that's one thing, or disturbing it um, really intentionally. But I find that a lot of these pollinating insects to be very innocuous, to, to really not be interested in people because they're so concentrated on pollinating in the middle of the growing season. Um, their favorite flowers are things like spotted bee balm and other bee balm species um, and other flowers that grow in these types of areas. So they're just so concentrated on that that they are not interested in stinging us. So I, I really think that supporting pollinators supports production of a lot of our agricultural crops. For instance, uh, in Maine, uh, low bush blueberries are one of our main agricultural crops and we need our native bees. Our bumblebees are especially adapted to the flower, the bell and urn like flowers of, of blueberries. Um, and so if we have our bumblebees, um, then we have, you know, a, a wide range of different species and diversity of bumblebees, then we're going to have more opportunities for our agricultural crops to be pollinated. We don't always need to rely on honeybees to, to be brought in. Um, and sometimes that can actually be very 
hard on honeybees to be moved around um, the country to be brought in to pollinate certain crops, like in California, the almond crops. A lot of the honeybees, when they're trucked in to pollinate the almond crops in California, die along the way because, or get infested with diseases and things like that, because it's just a really hard journey for them to make. They're packed into these dark trucks and sometimes very in very hot conditions. So I think allowing more um, pollinator habitat um, in around our farms and in our agricultural fields, this is going to provide more um, of a diversity of pollinators to pollinate our crops and to keep things healthy. I really like this book called Farming on the Wild Side. These Wild Sea Project members actually had a farm in um, Vermont called the farm between, and they uh, were actually dedicated to growing a lot of um, hedgerows and other crops of native plants, even native plants to sell, to not only encourage more pollinators, but they planted things like elderberry and aronia berry, or the black chokeberry in riparian buffers and along hedgerows so that they could also have um, berries to sell and the trees and shrubs to sell um, as well. So they they got a lot out of growing with native plants, including, you know, in addition to all their other species um, in order to increase the production and health and resiliency of their farm. So please take a look at this book. It's by John and Nancy Hayden. And thinking of farms, um, we can also think about planting um, areas around our, our productive crops with, you know, things like partridge pea. Um, it's an annual native kind of what you could call a cover crop because it, once you sow the seed, this is one of the main seeds that you, you can sow kind of out into, um, like open land, as long as there's open soil and it will come up the next year year and it will flower prolifically and be a real pollinator powerhouse. Um, so this is what you could use as a native cover crop for either either next to or inside a agricultural crop or you could use this to establish a new native meadow. Um, there's a lot of great ways to utilize partridge pea but what makes it such a pollinator powerhouse is that it um, actually has pollinating or it has flowers that contain lots of pollen, um, but the flowers themselves don't contain nectar. In fact, it actually has these little nectary glands at the base of the leaf petiole. Um, and you can see kind of in this picture, there's these, they look like little red dots just from afar. But if you look up close to them, they actually look like they're holding a little glistening ball of nectar in them. And lots of insects like butterflies, this azure butterfly, along with ants and beetles and wasps and bees um, and moths are attracted initially to the flowers, the flower color, but then they'll also be lured in by these nectary glands, which pay, play no part in reproduction for the plant. They're just there for the pollinators. And I think a lot of times there's other species of plants that have these nectary glands, like the sensitive plant. It looks a lot like partridge pea, but it's a it's a tropical counterpart to the to the partridge pea. Um, both of those plants actually um, use ants as a way to kind of protect them from herbivory. So while ants are eating the the nectar out of these nectary glands, they're you know they often secrete a lot of um, you know, um, chemicals that make them kind of not taste good to um, predators or make the, your mouth itchy or they sting. So that's a good way to kind of protect the plant from being um, eaten. And I think we can extend our uh, thinking about pollinator plants and pollinator habitat out to our riparian buffers, our forests, um, our hedgerows and buffers along agricultural areas, because we really need connected um, habitat. A lot of the wildlife habitat in our landscapes has been disconnected and fragmented by development and the parceling up of the land, privatization of our land. Most of, I think 70% of the main landscape is in private ownership. Um, and so the land is not um, 
always strategically connected. You know, conservation organizations are working and land trusts are working to connect fragmented land, but we can also do our part if we're private landowners. So we can add in buffers of native shrubs and trees and um, pollinator strips like with flowering plants like um, partridge pea and asters and comb flowers and and golden rods and things like that in order to add more wildlife value back to the land. So, you know, even farms can apply for what's called a SARE grant um, and other types of grants where they can participate in research on pollinators and other topics um, and be funded to help add these pollinator strips to their landscapes. So we can also create these pollinator corridors places for pollinators like the, the um, monarch butterfly to migrate through and find forage along the way. Um, in our cities and suburbs, uh, we can plant our neighborhoods with more wildlife um, habitat than that is native plants. And species like milkweed will help provide a larval host to the monarch butterfly. But we also, we monarchs need more than milkweed. We need to also plant a wide range of other flowering plants, especially plants that are blooming in the fall, so that monarchs, monarchs have something to forage on as adults when they're migrating south. Um, Port, the Portland Pollinator Vision Plan was developed with Wild Seed Project and the Conway School of Landscape Design in, I believe, 2015. Um, and that's a really great resource to look at for thinking about on a citywide level what we can do to increase pollinator corridors. So I encourage everyone to join the movement. You know, you can start planting native species. And if you want to get the word out, you can. Um, actually put in um, a nice sign that talks about how you're encouraging habitat for pollinators and birds. So you best not to mow it or don't spray pesticides and fertilizers on it. Um, and this is a really great way to kind of encourage people to um, see what you're doing, but not necessarily be confrontative about it. So we're not going to get all our neighbors to stop spraying fertilizers or mowing incessantly, but maybe if they see that we're doing something that looks beautiful across the street from them or down the street from them, then they might be encouraged over time to follow suit. Or it could just be those passersby that are already kind of interested um, and are liking that they see something different going on um, at your house, but and they want to be able to replicate it, this will help give them the tools to figure out how to how to start that project. Oh, I'm sorry, this is a leftover <laughs> piece from the Common Ground Fair. So you can ignore that. Um, so everyone, you know, I can send out this, this PDF of the presentation afterwards so that you can have these resources from the slides, but I, these are some of my favorite books for learning more about how to encourage pollinators in my backyard. Um, and here's some more resources from the Wild Seed Project. Uh, we have lots of articles on our website that are free to read and we have these publications where you can learn a lot more about all of these topics. So thank you everyone and I'd be happy to answer some questions with the rest of the time that we have left. Thank you so much Anna and I can already say we have more questions than we are going to get to, mm -hmm. um, but I will definitely in the follow up email that goes out later this afternoon, um, it would be great to include those slides. Thank you so much, Anna. Mm -hmm. And um, we'll also include a link to the Wild Seed Project. I was I was telling Anna before we got started here that after our program with the Wild Seed Project this time last year, I I signed up as a member so I can tell you uh, it is absolutely fabulous to do these members only questions uh, sessions that they they do on a monthly basis. So uh, I am not going to ask Anna all of your questions today because we're going to run out of time, but she's going to be able to answer them. Up in another forum. So let's get in a couple of, of questions right away. Um, no Mo May was a huge success. I definitely saw in my neighborhood lots and lots of people who, who embraced that and, and lots who said, okay, well, let's let this, this portion of the, the yard stay meadow for the summer. 
what do you recommend now, um, torn between wanting to, to mow down so that I can intentionally add some more native plants and, and do a little bit more cultivation of my, my weed patch slash meadow, um, but also wanting to, to provide that overwintering habitat and, and food. So what do we do with a meadow at the end of the season? Yeah, that's a good question. I think that'll depend a little bit on what you have plans for on your site. Um, but, you know, when you think about um, keeping the lawn in the areas that you want to keep it and maybe framing it with wild native plants or adding native plants into the areas to kind of slowly decrease your lawn, um, you can kind of take a couple of ways of attacking that. And so one way is to stop mowing that I liked no mow may a lot. It was a great um, start, but I don't think it's quite enough to really make a huge difference. I think um, we could, you know, you could take even like a small 10 by 10 or something patch of lawn to experiment with and do a no mow for the whole growing season or mow it just a couple times, keep the mower high and let the lawn flower. So when you do that, you can make observations and see what comes up. When things start flowering, you can um, identify those plants, like with a Newcomb's wildflower guide or the Go Botany site from Native Plant Trust or iNaturalist. I really like that one too. That's a phone app. Um, and you can kind of encourage the things that you want to that you want to stay and discourage the things that you don't want. So if you find out that something is just a non-native weedy plant, like a, maybe a European dandelion or something like that, you can uh, purposely cut back the flowers of those plants before they have a chance to go to seed. And if you find out that something has popped up that's a native species, like a wild strawberry um, or plantain leaf pussy toes, then you can leave those flowers there so that they can go to seed. And so that over time, it'll take many years, but that's one way that you can kind of favor the native plants and disfavor the non-natives. But a lot of us will have super, super weedy lawns that might even have invasives in them. And um, you can't necessarily expect overnight that you're going to just stop mowing and you'll have a beautiful native plant meadow. So I really like to, if you, if you just want to kind of start a little bit more from scratch, there's no such thing as truly starting from scratch because there's always weed seeds in the ground that will pop up. But if you want to start a little bit more from scratch, you can put down some um, layers of cardboard and mulch it's called sheet mulching over your mowed lawn so if you do that now in the fall then you can plant into it in the spring if you put it down in the spring then you can wait a little bit and plant into it in the fall what it entails is a nice thick layer of cardboard to kind of shade out the ground and smother the ground below smother the grasses and the other weeds um, and then you put about two to four inches of a good aged um, bark mulch or um, you can even do more if it's really potentially weedy and you need a lot of organic matter or you know aged leaf um, mulch too is really good and you can let that sit and break down and that or get adds organic matter to the soil but also provides after it's broken down over a few months it provides a really good planting medium to plant into so there you don't have to do any digging to get your lawn up. Um, and you can kind of start over and decide what you want to plant there. So I like to do either one of those or both at the same time. You could take one section for kind of letting things grow and seeing what comes up and use another section for doing that sheet mulch, sheet mulch method and planting into it. Terrific. Thank you so much, Anna. And I wish we could could spend the rest of the afternoon with you, but I know um, you have you have other things other things to move on to, and we are all looking forward to connecting uh, in in other ways after today. So look for that follow up email this afternoon. We'll have lots of links to all of the resources Anna talked about. Uh, Thank you so much for the work that the Wild Seed Project does. Thanks to all of you for joining us today. Uh, we are going to be continuing our focus on the, the on the ground work of, of fighting the climate crisis. Next week, our program is 
the big role of small scale farms in environmental conservation. And we will have uh, Florence Reed, who is the founder and director of sustainable growth for Sustainable Harvest International. She's going to share about some of some of sustainable harvests work and the way that uh, small farmers are really stabilizing the climate and bringing biodiversity back to degraded lands um, while they're also feeding the world. So pretty, uh, pretty impressive. We'll meet some of those unsung heroes next week. Hope you all have a fabulous weekend. Get out there and plant some native plants and uh, enjoy the beautiful fall. We will see you here next week. Thanks so much, Anna, and thanks to everybody. Thanks again. Have a good afternoon, everyone.